Yeah, so we have an update on noise pollution, um, also the semi pro football league, and also alternative sports season. And to me, there's something else I have an update for y'all on here, so y'all can quiz me. Cricket. Cricket World Cup, yes. Yes, so the Attorney General did provide a first draft of what that legislation, in fact, uh, an amendment to the noise pollution legislation would look like. Um, it found itself in the public domain and as a, pub, as a government that is uh, in full belief for transparency, we have absolutely no issues with uh, people from the community opining on what they've seen. Uh, what I can say is the police, the police went throughout the community subsequent to that to do their evaluation of decibel levels um, in terms of what would be acceptable in the different areas in Grosley and of course indeed legislation is national for St. Lucia and uh, they've presented some of their findings in terms of what decibel levels that we should be looking at. Um, so as we speak, we are pretty much fine-tuning everything. We are still communicating with uh, the police, with residents, with bar owners, uh, just to get a feel for how it is that we come to some form of a compromise. The fact of the matter is everybody's not going to be happy. There is just absolutely no way to make everybody happy as it pertains to noise pollution. But what we have to do as a government is to provide the legislation and to ensure that uh, the police as much as possible ensure that the laws are upheld. And so um, we're certainly hoping that very, very soon we will have the final, the final legislation. And of course, we will take it to Parliament for first reading. Well, the key parts of the legislation in terms of what did not exist before, before we as a government decided that we're going to do what we said we're going to do and provide representation for all, um, I can see my predecessors never did, um, was to deal with decibel levels. This is a new, uh, a new method of, of measuring, an objective method of measuring noise. And so at the end of the day, once you get the different decibel levels that should provide some level of comfort for you know, people to enjoy themselves while at the end of the day not really infringing on the rights of others to have some level of peace. The fact of the matter is we have, we have different parts of St. Lucia that are a dual, dual sort of, it functions as both an entertainment area and residency. And so you will not find a common ground uh, all the time. But we are definitely, as a government, we've worked very hard to ensure that we arrive at a, a level that, that should, be, should be able to give the police something to work with. Yes, you, you, you're thinking like a, a modern young individual. Certainly we've given a lot of thought to what it is that we can do um, to ensure that we, you don't want to go, I mean, I'm, I'm still relatively young. You don't want to go to a nightclub and it's quiet. You want to feel the music. You want to, at the end of the day, enjoy the vibration with your friends. Um, but we must ensure that it's done in a responsible manner and a considerate manner for others. And so we are considering some of the alternatives that we can actually give to those bar owners, those uh, restaurant owners, those individuals who have nightclubs, and how we can partner to ensure that some of the, the edifices that you spoke of and some of the different methods we can use to mitigate against noise getting out is, is done in a very, very strategic way. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag as yet, but um, uh, we definitely, as a government, looking at modern ways of doing that. And we're certainly hoping that um, everybody can come on board and appreciate all the efforts and uh, just really be it, um, each other's keeper. 
And so that's the direction we're moving into. Any updates on preparations for ICC work? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, today um, a lot of the work regarding preparations for ICC World Cup would be physically started. Uh, what you would appreciate is since last year, September, October, we put together a LOC, a local organizing committee, um, featuring individuals from all stakeholders within entertainment and, of course, marketing and sports. Um, so they have been doing their work, having regular meetings with ICC and Cricket West Indies. But today, you will see serious activity at the Darren um, the removal of the existing roof and uh, to replace it so we deal with all the leaks. Um, you would see also the surface, given the issues that we've had with flooding um, and the drainage, you would also see um, some significant work being done on the pitch on outfield, also at the Mendo Phillip Park. And uh, very soon you'll be seeing work happening at the Rosalie Plain Field. So there were pretty much three main areas of concern. The lights at Darren Sammy, they are not LED. They were installed in, in, uh, 20, in 2001. And so we had to move towards LED. And as a, as a minister of sport and, of course, an environmentalist, I always wanted uh, the opportunity to move towards LED and then, of course, move towards solar, solar lighting for the Darren Sammy Cricket Grounds. And so we've uh, officially contracted in, an individual to bring in LED lights uh, to St. Lucia as well. So the lights, um, the plain surface, and of course the roof to deal with the leaks and the stands will also be getting some attention ahead of cricket world cup and so you would be invited to the actual launch very very soon um there is a press launch i think on very so soon okay so that means they're working very fast yes yes hey, um i know that the middle field park is said to be a venue for uh, <laughs> for the same for mm -hmm. as well how would that look out because i know it's going to be I recently attended a uh, conference for sports ministers in the region. So I met with my colleagues from St. Kitts, from Barbados, from St. Vincent, from, and we are all going through something similar. A lot of the times we as St. Lucians believe that something that is happening in St. Lucia is only happening in St. Lucia. We are battling with climate change. We are battling with the fact that perhaps for the first time in a very long time, every single month from January last year to January this year, we've seen significant amounts of rain. This really hampers what you can do in your facilities. For instance, um, we've, we've done a lot of work on the stands at uh, Mendo Phillip Park, but in terms of the surface, we were preparing our surface for a lot of the inter-house competitions and also Cricket West Indies, ICC, T20, and also for the launch of the semi-pro um, league. But we've had a number of issues simply because of the fact that we've just been experiencing incessant rain. And that's the same thing for our road networks, the same thing for a number of other aspects of how we develop our country. Uh, it's really prohibitive to do things in rain. So we continue to work. Martinez Avery continues to work on the drainage at the Mendo Phillip Park. And the expectation is that, again, we're going to have delays because some of the inter-house competitions would have been postponed and pushed back. And so he's going to continue to work on the drain and on the surface and it will be available for Cricket World Cup and we will have a special dispensation for the launch of our semi-pro league on March 3rd which is slated for the Mindo Phillip Park for obvious reasons. It's historic, it's the home of uh, a lot of footballers in St. Lucia, it's uh, Mindo Phillip Park is pretty much um, where, where it goes down and I think the historic nature of it uh, warrants us having that day. We are then going to move to the other grounds, the other venues while we are preparing for Cricket World Cup and thereafter uh, we'll continue to host games at the Mendo Phillip Park for the Northern clubs and organizations. Ah, uh, other than the fact that anytime you have a St. Lucian looking somewhere in Cricket West Indies, we get success. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's uncanny. I mean, ever since, Darren Sam is not the coach of the test team, but you've seen his exploits with the shorter version of the game. And it's all, it, it, it is transferring to what we are actually seeing with the test team. The Cricket West Indies took the policy, took the position, that they were going to invest in a team. And I think that is what's critical. 
there was so much conversation about why young Bravo didn't make the team and some other people did not make the team. And we are going with so many young people. But Darren Sammy as a coach always preaches the unity and not necessarily stardom of an individual. So it's a team. So what we're seeing with Cricket West Indies right now is a, a paradigm shift, a mentality shift where the younger players understand that they have to lean on each other for success. This is what Darren Zambi did as a captain. And this is what he is bringing into Cricket West Indies as a coach. And so whereas we are celebrating 27 years with not one in Australia, I, I think all of us who followed the life of Darren Zambi understands that, hey, he may not be the coach there, but the culture within what Cricket West Indies is right now, along with the president, uh, another young individual, um, really culture shift in terms of what the focus is when it comes to West Indies cricket. And so congratulations, hats off to them. It's historic, but we expect for it to continue and to carry on and for us to have a very good showing when we come to the West Indies for Cricket World Cup in, in June. From during that series, uh, of some more experienced players going to play um, in T20 leagues, preferring right. that over Test cricket, um, largely because of lack of pain, I guess. Mm -hmm. How can we improve that? Because the lot of our the game is dying, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that we have some young students who want to play for the five day cricket. So how can we improve that to improve the showing of the young people? Mm -hmm. There are a couple of realities in the West Indies. There are a couple of realities. For instance, if you look at the population of the West Indies as a people, we are barely breaking 16 million people, barely. And I think I have exaggerated what it is here. When you look at a country like Australia, when you look at India with a billion people, uh, and you look at some of what we have to com compete with, Pakistan, Pakistan, perhaps another 300 million people. Um, we, we do not have the human capital that brings in the resources, that brings in the sponsorship and the investment from corporate, the corporate world into the cricket in our region. And that, that is what has shifted from the 90s into the 2000s. The actual you know, shift in where uh, corporate, the corporate world has prioritized. And so we as a government, we have launched an HPC, a High Performance Center for Cricket. So we have almost 20 of our best cricketers in a program where they are given a stipend every month. Uh, they are given nutritional advice and food. They are given mental, mental coaching, game situation um, development. And so we focus on in these individuals so that they can play all formats of the game. Because uh, an individual can become a millionaire instantly by playing franchise cricket. But we do have individuals that are purists, that like the longer format of the game. And we want them to focus on that because once you have those technical, tactical skills, it transforms into the 50 and the 20 over. So for us as a government, we are really focused on the holistic development of the person and the mental development of the individual. Because once we do that, we understand that these individuals will become financially competent and will be able to support their family and give back to our society. So it's a balanced approach. Uh, I know you wanted to speak about this point, but before you go there, um, what were excellent for mm -hmm. your decision to part ways, not be part of the whole alternative sports season? Mm -hmm. Here are some of the facts. Before we became the government, there was no support. There was no support for alternative sports or there was very little support. And you know, sometimes uh, we, we rush the brush. We are only in government for two and a half years. And what we've tried to do is to get people to come together, get the corporate society to come on board and the government to do their part we are not going to be able to furnish everybody with all their desires. But what we've done is we've committed to partner with them at every step, every step of the way. Um, some people will be disappointed with the amount of support, but it is absolutely crazy for anybody to say there is no support, considering we put this together. And so the reality of this situation is there are a lot of personality issues. There are a lot of issues with the association that, um, that I, as a minister, believe could be resolved and could be dealt with differently. 
but we continue to provide a lot of support for chess. We continue to provide moto um, um, drag racing with a lot of support. Um, all of the sports like um, dominoes, um, you know, drafts and all of the sports, you know. And so it's a wider sector of people that we've put together and we've clustered. And the fact of the matter is the sum total of these people might be similar in terms of those people involved, might be similar to what's involved in the traditional sports. And so as a government, we continue to try to get people to, to come to the fore and provide sponsorship, but it's not just going to happen within two years and it's going to be all hunky-dory. So for anybody to have pulled out so early, I think would be ill-advised, um, but we continue to provide as much support as we can and encourage people to unify behind the development of sport. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. We've we've made a lot of a number of site visits in the area because there were some issues with DCA and the usage of that area. I remember myself um, touring that area, being through some of the activities. I mean, showing my support. Um, at the very end, we as a government cannot interfere in the activities of an association. We cannot force an association to be with us. Um, we will, to this day, if we are provided with a proposal that we can financially absorb and assist with, we would. Um, and that is our policy and our position with all sport in St. Lucia and we continue to be just that. We launched the semi-pro football league on Friday uh, for the first time in St. Lucia's history footballers will be given compensation for playing the game. Uh, as I said during this uh, ceremony, um, it is not going to be pretty at the beginning. Anytime you're changing and you're bringing something in new, uh, certain people would feel aggrieved with what they get and others would feel happy with what they get. But the fact of the matter is we ran our election indicating that we're going to be focused on people. We're going to be people focused. And the Prime Minister also indicated before he was elected that uh, a youth economy, uh, youth, young people being involved in economic activities based on their talents would be the order of the day. And so this is what we've seen. For the first time, and as I said in that ceremony, I played the football for St. Lucia, and we have a number of other individuals who played football uh, all their life. And the sum total of what I probably got financially from playing football, even at a national level, I calculated was negative $20,000. Because at the end of the day, I never got paid a cent for my time and my effort, and I had to deal with my injuries and pay for anything medical that occurred on the field. And uh, if you speak to any other national players, they would tell you it's negative 100,000, negative 70,000. And for some individuals who cannot walk as a result of playing football, the price goes up. And the fact that this government has moved every individual from getting zero dollars per game in their life to $200 at the beginning per match, I think is very good. It's a start and we're asking corporate St. Lucia and all community residents and businesses within the communities to come on board to augment this amount and ensure that we continue to develop uh, football in a, in a huge capacity. In addition to that, we've said training commitment, discipline is going to be something important. So we've decided that we are paying what we call somewhat of a retainer, a particular amount, let's just say 500 every month for training. So at the end of the day, if you miss a training session, that amount goes to 475. If you miss two, it goes down to 450. But your commitment to training is going to pretty much indicate the amount you get at the end of every month. And again, that same amount would be used for discipline. If you get a red card, you might be, and the understanding would be you understand that from your league. If you get a red card, if you curse, if you do something, I mean, illegal, then that amount goes down significantly. Could You could lose $100 for, for dissent, for different things. So. We are investing in developing the person while they develop their finances. And we are going to have a number of programs for these footballers in terms of money management, in terms of developing themselves off the field. And so it's a program that we're asking all of St. Lucia to do their part, especially corporate St. Lucia. Do your part. This is novel. This has never happened in our history. And we did say we were going to take sport to another level, and this government is definitely doing so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. number of youth um, initiatives. Initiatives started in the youth um, with the whole press towards diminishing, you know, what we've seen in terms of crime or not. Your thoughts on this um, collaborative um, venture? I definitely leave that to the, the Minister of, of Equity, who's doing an absolute excellent job. 
by the way. I mean, historic, a number, this government has been doing a number of novel and historic programs within our communities to target ordinary people. And this is another example where we don't just uh, talk the talk, but we walk the walk. We target those individuals and we go after them strategically. For my ministry, we have a, a wiry program with USAID where in, in the communities we look for more interventions for displaced young people to actually find out from them what some of the issues are and provide training and partnerships. And do you see with the Ministry of Equity this thrust towards targeting these individuals because if you don't have a targeted approach to what you're doing and you'll just be spinning top in mud going all over the place. But this is another example of how this government is definitely doing their part just as sports, a semi-professional league, individuals understanding that you can get off the block right now, you can go to training, you can become part of a club, an organization where you can get compensated at the end of the month for your talent and skill. These are game changers. We're expecting those things to be game changers where young people can realize, hey, I have an alternative path to success in St. Lucia rather than just going in illicit activities. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, okay, I'm here to, to share with you some news I consider to be exciting. Of course, you would have heard of, of the MSME, the small um, loan arrangement that is government. You've heard of the youth economy um, directing in terms of providing more support at people. But we've had the Bell Fund that has been around for, for 20, over 24 years, thereabout. And one would have asked what has become of the Bell Fund. Of course, the Bell Fund was arranged providing loans of $20,000. You need some guarantors to sign off. And of course, they were doing quite a bit. To date, more than 1,500 persons can boast of the support of the Bell Fund. But during the economic hardship, COVID and what have you, and the fact that persons are not able to even have guarantors, the Bell Fund, I'm happy to report that Bell Fund has made some adjustments. So to date, you, you can get at least over from five to $30,000 without having the need of three guarantors. You can have at least one guarantor based on the amount that you, 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 you're seeking. Um, and also, if you're prepared to have a, a salary deduction, you probably would consider not having any guarantors. So Belfond has made it a lot easier for you to access microloan. They would do the assessment. They evaluate what you're coming to do, of course, and it provides an avenue to tie in with what we are doing. And there are a set of persons who are not able to go to, to a world, will, who will not receive the support from the Ministry of Commerce under the small um, loan arrangement, or persons who would not be able to, or find it um, through age group not able to access the youth economy, Bell Fund is available. And Bell Fund would provide support, micro loans for you to pursue your business. Again, this time, without the, with a reduction in some of the the, the, the rules associated in accessing it. So you do not need to come up with three guarantors to get a loan from Bell Fund. This is good news for persons who um, are interested in pursuing business, recognizing that we're dealing with the unemployment situation solution. And of course, we, we recognize a growing number of persons are interested in pursuing small business. You know, and I'm extremely happy about this as well. Yes? Yes. Of course. Of course, Bell Fund would accommodate because, of course, it has to do with the business arrangement that you embarked on. And of course, Bell Fund would be would be able to assess what is the business, what business you, and they would take a they, they would take a, the chance with you based on the nature of what you. I'm not a business person. Um, I'm a surveyor by profession. But there are people who are able to come up with business ideas, and they just need to get the support. Yes, retirees persons, senior persons can go to Belfast and you can get as much as 30,000 from five, and look at the range, from 500 to 30,000. You know, 
Again, Bell Fund is marketing this, and of course, this um, um, statutory arrangement was established in 2000, you know, and to date, we can boast of having to success of approximately 1,500 persons. You know, sometimes persons speak about how many persons has failed, but not discuss how many persons have been successful. If Bell Fund has assisted and, and 1,500 persons can boast of going through Belfort to have something today or doing something that is significant in the context of providing opportunities for people. I, uh, I want to speak on the semi-colleague again. Um, I saw you clapping on the side there. Uh, how, from, 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 from an equity standpoint, how does this improve the lives of, of young people, of young men in particular, and well, the, the professionals who are employed in the football scene? The principle of equity, um, how I, I think the, the, the opportunities for people, it provides another layer of support. So we are targeting people, and I'm happy that the Minister of Youth and Sports is also look, looking at livelihoods, is also looking, looking at the issues of providing food to people, um, looking at the, our humanity. So a set of young men who want to engage in football would not just engage in football at... at, at at their expense, but the government is investing in saying that you can at least find your meals by playing football if you're not able to do better than that. And if you are um, working um, other, um, otherwise, but you, it's not adequate to carry your football career, that will, you know, supplement your income and what have you. So the principle of equity, I think it provides additional opportunity because we do not have that happening at any level currently. Um, um, I do not know for the other sporting disciplines, whether golfers, I do not know what happened in the area of golf in St. Lucia, but I think it's a different set of people um, participating in that as against to the persons who are participating in football. So football is really where the, um, more persons participate in football than any other sporting discipline on this island. So of course the investment is significant. It provides opportunity and not just the initial, but it will grow. The Minister, of, the minister of, 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 of Youth and Sports and the Prime Minister, the trajectory is that we continue to invest and we expect it to grow. So not where we stand in today that, that is important, but where we want to go with our people, I think, is what is critical, you know. Yeah. Yes, so they get a grant from government, and they have, that has been going on for some time now. But also this year, we are looking um, at support from the Caribbean Development Bank for institutional strengthening. So we're looking to strengthen um, Belford through the Caribbean Development Bank so that they can do a lot more than what they're doing. So quite a bit will be, um, will be done where Belford is concerned. So just the idea of having an environment where micro-enterprise and support for vulnerable people are available at the youth economy, the small business arrangement, and now we are equipping Bell Fund to, to respond. So persons, I know that there's the fast cash and there are the um, money setups, but they are not directed, they're not, Bell Fund is not profit driven as much as it has a social conscience to help vulnerable population. And that's significant in, in the scheme of things. The youth economy, is not a profit making, it's not set up to make profit, it's set up to facilitate persons, the youth who wants to participate in small business. And of course, if you look at the design of the small business arrangement from the Ministry of Commerce, again, there's a heavy emphasis on people and the social arrangement to facilitate our people. So Bell Fund is, is, is committed to that and it's, it's from us, it's from you. The support is really coming from the people, it's taxpayers' money coming from you to yourselves and how there's no other, there's no better way to help people than when we are able to to get taxpayers to facilitate improvement of our people so the government has contributed over the years and will continue to support Bell Fund, but it will grow a lot more especially listen closely to to what may, what will be approved in the budget as we speak to improving Bell Fund. Yes. yes. The, the importance of the alliance speaks 
to what all of us um, have been saying. The issue of crime and violence and deviant behavior is a matter for everyone. And the, the alliance is really, it epitomizes this concept that everyone is involved and everyone should take that as the responsibility and see what is it we can do. Um, certainly we have a problem on, on our hands across the region in terms of gun violence, deviant behavior, and all sorts of, you know, behavior that, that makes it uncomfortable for the average citizen. Um, so the alliance coming together, the support of the government again, um, is to bring all of the individuals with capacities, with, with competences that can help respond in different ways. So the, the issue of having rise, and, and you see persons like, like Dr. King who has been associated with youth interventions, you know, and a number of other um, social agencies and partners, NGOs and, and, and CBOs, they all are together um, discussing the issues, advising government, designing programs. And, and the more persons that are able to contribute to the design of responses in communities that we believe that, that has the tendency to become that way is the better for us, the more accurate will be the response and there will be a collective approach to it. As against government sitting within the offices, um, the officers and coming up without having that broad level of consultation and participation dealing with the issue of crime and violence. So the Alliance is novel in the sense that it, it, it mobilizes our, our human resource on island. And I think it also would be very responsive and timely, especially for what we're dealing with at this time. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to take this opportunity this morning to report on a short trip that I made to Guyana. I was heading a delegation. In fact, I headed a delegation to Guyana to actually view some of the agricultural innovation projects that is happening there. And I was very happy to see some very, very key projects that contribute immensely to food security in Guyana. One of the projects that I was very, that, that, in, that I was really interested in was a youth entrepreneur project where the young people in Guyana will involve or are involved in what we call shade house agriculture or preferably called greenhouse agriculture or you can also call it protected agriculture and that form of agriculture is important especially in the rainy season where the rains heavy rains consistent heavy rains can reduce your yield and impact your production so we were able to visit a site in Guyana where the government established 54 greenhouses and those greenhouses are used to produce various vegetable crops like celery, cabbage, sweet pepper, tomatoes, etc. But that project is linked to the University of Guyana and the Guyana School of Agriculture. So what happens, those students would come in, they would use that site for the SBAs and the other projects at the university. They would benefit by getting the training necessary. And after a period of time, between one year to four years, they would leave and go out there and establish their own agricultural business. I believe that is very good for the young people because that type of agriculture is what I believe can attract a lot more younger folk, folks into agriculture. I, we also had the opportunity to visit an agro-processing facility, sorry, a hydroponic farm where the government of Israel is collaborating with the government of Guyana to establish hydroponic systems throughout the country. But there is this company that was able to establish a specific farm where young people are being trained. The hydroponic system can produce up to 100,000 seedlings. 
and that includes celery, sweet pepper, lettuce, a range of agricultural products. That I think goes well for us, and I believe it's an opportunity for us to replicate the same in St. Lucia and link it to South Luis and the other secondary schools where our students very early can get involved in agriculture and see agriculture as a profession that is that they can survive and earn a livelihood from. We also visited demonstra demonstration farms in various regions in Guyana where those farms are actually established for farmer training, for training of young persons aspiring to become professionals in agriculture. We also had the opportunity to engage the Guyana School of Agriculture, where we saw the students actually getting involved in agro-processing, where they are using the pro produce that are, are grown on the school compound or in the vicinity of the school, and using it to, to convert into agro-processed products. Very, very interestingly, we were able to visit the Guyana Marketing Corporation. And there we were able to see the whole agro-processing subsector and its vibrancy because there were more than 300 local products on display. And it, you can name it wines and chips and so many things that were able to be on display there. And we think that is an opportunity for us to work together with them to secure market opportunities for our agro-processing down there. To, how we can collaborate in terms of sharing the experience with them and being able to help us in terms of moving our agro-process um, subsector. We did engage the University of Guyana in terms of opportunity for training. And we have been promised an opportunity sometime this year to get at least two scholarships for persons who do agriculture at the University of Guyana. But all in all, I must say it was a very wonderful trip and from what I saw, Guyana is in the right, is taking the right direction and putting the measures in place to ensure that they achieve their 25 by 25 that's next year. I must say, as a follow-up to that, we are already in discussion as to identify, identification of a site to establish that sort of agricultural innovation. And we've been given the guarantee that we'll get technical support and other financial resources to support us in, in bringing this opportunity for our young people in St. Lucia. Um, all in all, I think moving forward, we have agreed to establish an MOU for technical support and cooperation between the government of Guyana and the government of St. Lucia. I'm sure you recall some of them last year, we did sign an MOU between the government of St. Vincent and the government of St. Lucia. Considering the importance of climate change and how it can impact the agricultural sector in our region, we think it is very opportune now for us as a region to come together and work together, share information to give support to our countries in the region to ensure that we are food secure. Do you have the actual date for visit? Well, we left, the visit was from, the, uh, from Monday last week to Thursday. It was basically a three-day visit. Um, yes, the Senate meeting, um, I know, well, I think you're looking for the food security and nutrition plan. Yes. Yes, so the CELAC is basically communities of Latin America and the Caribbean meeting. We had the opportunity to, to put together a food and nutrition security plan because Latin America, America and the Caribbean, you know, we are together, although the climate is different in, 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 the Car in, in our region versus the Latin America, but we felt it was necessary for us to work together to address the whole food and nutrition security issue. I think what is really important in this plan is the understanding that climate change can have very negative consequences on the agricultural sector. <clears throat> there is urgent need for us to build resilience in the sector. We just recently experienced last week consistent heavy rains, something that is almost rare in the month of January. Last year, during the period August to September, we experienced extremely high temperatures, and all of those um, 
concerns needs to be addressed because it can really impact our food security. So the old CELAC approach was the Caribbean region coming together with Latin America and work on what we call a food security and action plan to address the issues that confront the region and Latin America under one umbrella. Well, the plan basically looks at where we are in terms of our import, and we know our food import bill is extremely high. We, this, it has areas in terms of how we can move more of our produce in within the region. It, there are issues in terms of support for small farmers. There are issues in terms of marketing of our produce. Agricultural insurance is a very important aspect of that because every time we have a hurricane in St. Lucia, the poor taxpayers have to be, we have to use their resources to compensate or assist our farmers. If we have agricultural insurance, the pressure on the government will be less because those insurance or whatever insurance company we have will be responsible for assisting or compensating those farmers. There were issues in the plan relating to water and water availability, water soil conservation methods. So it's a very comprehensive plan, which I believe, if implemented, will see our region doing extremely well in terms of reduction of our food import bill. I have heard of it, but I have not seen it anywhere. I have heard of it, and if it is something that's happening, it's very unfortunate for us, but sometimes we don't understand the pressures that our farmers go through when they invest their time and money into production, but when they are ready for harvest, somebody else would have collected it, and that is why Pridia Lassini is a major factor in the agricultural sector that we need to address. Now, the pretty Alassini unit within the ministry is very small. I think it's less than 20 persons. And you're talking thousands and thousands of acres of bananas, vegetable planting all together. So aside the pretty Alassini team, I believe we need to establish what we call community groups, community farming groups to be able to assist those teams. Because just like the police, every time somebody, something happens, somebody's dead, they blame the police and people say the policemen cannot be everywhere at the same time. So the pretty Alassini small team is just not sufficient to be able to address the issues of pretty Alassini. But it's unfortunate that you go by the market and you buy a plantain or a hand of banana, but when you go and cook it, it has needles and pins inside. This is not what we expect from our persons. But as I tell you, the agricultural sector, you can invest your time and resources but you may never be able to reap the benefits at the end of the day because of pretty But is that a trend that you would... No, no, to don't to even continue that. There is no way we will encourage people to put pins and, and those things in, in, in produce for people. This is something that should never happen. So this is something we will never encourage as a ministry. It's not quite true. I had a discussion with Renault because I'm very familiar with the arrangement Renault has with St. Vincent. And Renault wanted to, he indicated interest in doing the same thing here. And I believe at the end of the day, personally, it is going to be beneficial to the farmers. Because if the farmers know that when they produce a particular crop, they harvest every single commodity, they take it to the market, they get their money minutes after, they will obviously increase their production because at the end of the day, they know when I take it to the market, I get people. We have the St. Lucia Marketing Board, which is an entity that was established for marketing of the farmer's produce. We have, uh, I forget the name, um, Export not Export St. Lucia, Super J, I forget the, Marcy. Marcy. 
with arrangements with farmers in terms of thank you for for, for correcting me Massey a lot of farmers have you know special arrangements and agreements with Massey and they sell to Massey then you have the hotels so we have to consider how this is going to impact those other marketing sources that our farmers are already engaging but in the absence of that that would have been the best for our farmers but not because it's working well in St. Vincent that it may work just as well for St. Lucia. So you say the production supply is not enough to That too. To that. But the other entities that are already buying from the farmers may be impacted as a result of that, going into that new venture. But is it not something where other, I guess other farmers who maybe not have been um, producing at that scale to export to, or not export, sorry, to, to sell to Massey or to the marketing board or to the hotel, that is a good one but just imagine you have the marketing board you have Marcy you have the hotels would you as a farmer want to sell to Marcy knowing that you have to wait seven days or knowing that you were given a price per, per pound today but next day when you go it's reduced or you have to wait three months to get your pay from the hotel any farmer who's business-minded would go straight to that company, Renault, because at the end of the day, they buy every single item that you have and you get your money right on site. So but at the end of the day, <laughs> Julio Furt, it is the best for our farmers. Well, yeah, it, it is the better option for our farmers, but isn't it something when a hotel gets up and then buy from Renault, since he would have taken up everything? That is also possible. Because he then can also handle the credit. Yes. Yeah, but what would happen to the ma what would happen to the what would happen to the marketing board? <laughs> what would happen to the marketing board? What would happen to Marcy? When Marcy went to the marketing board, it's I was there last week. Supplies of stuff is slow. You're talking about you referring to the shop? Yeah. I mean by the the, the, the outlet that by the market? Yeah. Oh no, I thought you were referring to the the place at Odsa. So they buy the From marketing board have Sorry. contracts with farmers oh, no. who supply the marketing board on a regular basis. I sell to the marketing board too. So, um, and who does marketing board sell that? They sell to the hotels, oh. they sell to the small restaurants, and they sell to the public. So, the rest of means for the rest of people. So, again, do you get paid on time from the marketing board? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that was a specific question. I realize that. <laughs> I realize that. <laughs> No, I like the Renault idea, but there are other, you know, factors that you have to take into consideration to make it a reality in St. Lucia. You have a final? Yes. I saw you laughing at me a while ago. <laughs> I was, I'm just joking. <laughs> yes, yes. Let me, let me just mention agriculture. There are a range of insect and pests that just emerge. So for example, recently, we've been witnessing or experiencing some problems in watermelons. The crop is grown very healthy. Weeks before harvesting, all the foliage disappears. We have problems in our coconuts, our coconut mite. You remember we were exporting mangoes, maybe you're not born yet, mangoes to Barbados, and because of the mango seed weevil, we stopped exporting. So there are a range of insect pests that are just emerging because of the whole issue of climate change and so on. Now the yam issue is a first time thing. We've not had that experience before. Before we had insects in the soil attacking the yam and sometimes when the yam is, is harvested it's hard. But those insects could have been controlled. But just last week I was told that there is a new disease that's been seen in the yams and the farmers are experiencing some difficulty. What our research team is doing is to, we are now conducting an investigation to identify the disease, the source, and to see how we can get it under control. But in agriculture, you would grow your cucumbers, and you know, seven days after, I just had to spray my cucumbers, my cucumber field last week, you know? So you have to be doing that because the insect pests, they are there to feed on the plants. 
But at the end of the, of the day, your objective is to rip off the most you can get from your crop, and so you have to ensure that you get it under control. Fertilizer. A lot of salts. Yes, a lot of salts. <laughs> I prefer the word fertilizer. Yeah, and yeah. we've been doing a lot of things that, and a lot of these things are causing issues. We know that. And could it be just that, that all this distance is contributing to creating more issues and an environment for all these viruses, bacteria, protozoans, fungus to come in and to do what they're doing? Is it just climate change, more rain or, or less, or more heat that is actually causing this? But there are a number of. There are a number of factors that can cause it. You can move a disease from one country to the next if you step in a particular area on your armboard. For example, the, black, the, the TR4 disease, it can move from place to place by human beings. Now, our soils, there is what we call fertile soils and less fertile soils. As you continue to grow crops on the same piece of land, your fertility level will diminish, deteriorate, and as a result, the healthiness, the, because of the, the fact that the soil is less healthy, the plants are more susceptible, susceptible, susceptible to, it's, it's, it's sus prone or susceptible to disease. Sorry for the, for the, for the lack of um, mentioning the word properly. So it's just like you, if you don't eat well, on a day to day, obviously it's easy for you to, you know, be faced with a disease or, or ailment, anything like that. So, what we need to do is to practice that form of agriculture, what you call rotation. Yeah. So, you plant corn, and then the next time you plant something else. But remember, we have had that monoculture form of cultivation with bananas. So, the roots of the plants were at the same level all the time. And obviously, if that continues to happen, there is an, uh, at some point, you will not be able to get that level of nutrients that was once available. So that is why it's important to adopt what we call a kind of mixed type of, of, of um, agriculture. So you have the, the banana, you have the tree crops, and you have the other crops that can reach different levels of the soil. But your question in terms of climate change, yes, it may. Because the winds, when you have natural disasters, hurricanes, you have strong winds that can move pests and disease from place to place. So this also is a factor. But our soils will be diminished if it is not well managed. And if you do not do the, 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 adopt the type of practices in agriculture that would cause what we call nutrient recycling and to ensure your soil remains as fertile as possible. Mixed farming. Yeah. yeah, that's why we encourage our farmers. And in the days when we were, our, our farmers were involved in bananas, what we were encouraging them to do, and I remember when I was in forestry, we were encouraging them to put in more tree crops on that same piece of land where they had the bananas. What would happen is they would be getting an income from the, from the bananas, but they would also be getting an income from the avocado, the coconuts, the breadfruit, the mango, the lime. But during that time, the focus was money. And this whole monoculture thing is, it is a light demander, so I don't want anything to grow between my bananas. And so they cut a lot of the tree crops that if they did not, would be benefiting from today. And this is why when you have a, you see, a, you, we have a hurricane, after a hurricane, you see the fields, Nothing else. And this is not the type of agriculture we want to encourage our farmers to engage in. But is this something that you, uh, that your ministry can, I guess, we have been, push? We have been advocating that. We have been advocating that. But it's one thing to tell this young lady to put trees on the land and for her to say, this is nonsense. I don't believe in, this, in those guys. I will do what I'm accustomed to. And this is why we have to be, begin or continue to 
educate our farmers to change their approach to agriculture. Mechanization, new technologies in agriculture, this is the way to go. Because if not, we will have a failed agriculture because our young people like you and her will not come in for speed when they can use a simple drone to do what can be done. Am I right, sister? <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you very much. So good. Honorable Dr. Ernest Tillet, who is also Minister for Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture and Information. Good morning. Been a while to me since yes. I last saw you. Yeah? Yeah. I heard you all have not invited me. So at least thank you very much. Maybe we can start with you. Do you have any questions you want to ask? Yes, Mr. Yeah, it's called the Tourism Advisory Committee, um, where we meet on a quarterly basis with um, the stakeholders of the tourism industry to discuss um, developments in the industry, to review the performance of the industry, and for us to plan how we can address some of the critical issues. So last week's meeting um, reviewed um, the performance of the industry for last year, um, and we did have good news to report in terms of the growth um, in tourism arrival numbers, um, both cruise and stay over. Um, we also looked at the new developments that will be coming on stream, um, the Mont Pinamad development, the Ridgeway Beach development, Shabusha in Strozel, um, you know, Black Bay, and you know, some other developments that will um, be you know, implemented over the next few months. I highlighted to the meeting some of the the major challenge we'll face this coming year as a number of rooms come off the market. Already St. James Club, which is almost 350 rooms, is not, um, those rooms are not on the market right now. And we expect in the middle of the year for both Mystic and for Staffish to also close for the new construction to start. So you're really talking about you know, almost 900 rooms off the market right now and that will put a lot of stress and strain on us because there's a huge demand for rooms in St. Lucia. So as we prepare to get more room stock, we will go through um, a challenging period. But we expect in the next two to three years to add over t about a thousand new rooms in St. Lucia, which um, is a desirable state that we want to achieve. We're expecting the cruise passengers um, infrastructure cruise services infrastructure to improve with the GPH project being implemented, the developments in port castries. And of course, you, you know that we will be doing some dredging at Point Seraphine, the boardwalk that will be built at the waterfront to introduce an entire new experience, an amphitheater at Serenity Park, a new vendor's arcade, the Fisherman's Village um, in Banan, and of course, the redevelopment of the Soufre. Um, waterfront. So St. Lucia's to cruise tourism infrastructure will be significantly upgraded over the next couple of years. Um, in the next sitting of Parliament, we will be um, tabling the Tourism Development Bill, um, which is aimed at transforming the tourism industry, offering more support for St. Lucians getting involved in the tourism industry. And the incentives regime to be expanded beyond just accommodation, but to all sectors of the tourism industry is a major piece of legislation. So certainly looking forward to presenting it um, in the House. Another big announcement which we'll be making is the reestablishment of the Rangers unit. Um, you would remember a few years ago, um, we had a unit that was dedicated to performing, providing support to the police um, in certain areas um, that fall under the NCA, the beaches, the um, dedicated areas. And of course, we will be relaunching the Rangers Unit. It was stopped by a past government, but it will be um, re-established to ensure that you know, we provide adequate security and support for the police in strategic areas. Um, you, we're expecting some major announcements again, as I said, in terms of the tourism product development in St. Lucia. Um, a lot is going to happen 
over the next couple of years to improve our tourism infrastructure and improve the product. But most important for us is that we want more St. Lucians to get involved in the tourism industry. We want more St. Lucians to participate and to own the tourism industry. We believe the best approach is to achieve two main goals. One, to get visitors to spend more money in St. Lucia. And secondly, to get more St. Lucians owning the tourism industry. So as more money is spent, more St. Lucians will benefit from it. And that is our driving motivation. So we have some exciting days ahead for the tourism industry. And like I said, um, very shortly, the Tourism Authority will share with you the official figures. But we, we saw an, an increase in arrivals last year over 2022, and it's in, in, um, getting closer to 2019 figures. Our biggest challenge in surpassing 2019 right now is regional travel. In, if you look at the figures in 2019, we had over eight, almost 88,000 arrivals regionally. Um, last year, we'd have done just over 50,000. Um, we still have a challenge with regional arrivals. And for that reason, we've not been able to um, match 2019 figures, which were the highest figures achieved in St. Lucia. My question is about 2020. Uh, I think that's the first time I am speaking to you since the announcement of the package. What is your th what are your thoughts on St. Lucia's the package that we received? Mm -hmm. In addition, speak to preparations, particularly because you spoke a while ago about the challenge with the, the rooms. Um, how would we cope during that time, particularly because we'll teach what is in the middle of the year? Yeah. Um well, I mean put it that way, if you ask me what I think of the, the package, I certainly would have wished we could have gotten all the matches. Um, but that's not possible. Um, and other countries bidded a lot more money than us. The approach that was used this time as against Cricket World Cup in 2007 and the World T20 in 2010. Um, I happen to have been the tournament director in 2010 and a completely different approach was used. This approach, the West Indies Cricket Board actually asked territories to bid for matches, which uh, matches. They didn't have packages per se, but they said what you can bid for the finals, the semi-finals, and you can bid for England matches, whatnot. And they did not give you um, a price. They would just ask you to declare a bid. So where you might bid 5 million US for the finals, somebody has given 8 million US for the finals. So you wouldn't get it. And nobody knew it, it, it was a closed bidding process. Um, so we did make our bid for what we wanted. Um, we, 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 we got a, a good package. I, I think St. Lucia did get a good package, um, but obviously others bidded a lot more than us because I know what we bidded and for, the, for them to have gotten so much more in some instances tells a lot about how much they bidded and how much they valued hosting um, World T20 matches. St. Lucia's cricketing infrastructure also needs to be upgraded. Um, as you can imagine, the outfield at the Darren Summit Cricket Ground was completed in 2002. Um, so, you know, you're talking about a surface that's 22 years old and you know, it really needs upgrading. Um, the lights were put in shortly after, by I think 2003, 2004. So those lights are like 20 years old. Um, lighting has advanced considerably since then. Um, so everybody has gone LED um, and even solar um, to, to, to power the LED lights. So we're way behind in that regard. The, the technology the infrastructure has also been upgraded. When we did this, it was for 2007. And there's been major upgrades in the world of technology um, as it relates to that. So we really need to upgrade Darren Sami to be world class once again. And of course, the practice venues at Grusile and Mindo Philip Park also need to, to be upgraded. So we will see a lot of investment in those areas. As it relates to accommodation, um, I mentioned both Starfish and Mystic will be closed. But Mystic will only close after cricket because it is going to be used, you know, as one of the cricketing hotels. Um, in 2007, when we were at Cricket World Cup, and the Dr. Kenny Anthony and, and Minister Pierre, uh, who is Prime Minister now, we actually started the home accommodation program in St. Lucia as far back as then. Even before they had Airbnb and those things, St. Lucia had, had a special um, incentive for St. Lucians to add rooms to their home. 
to enable us to host the persons that would come in for Cricket World Cup in 2007. So a lot of the room stock we have now actually start, came into play in 2007. There's a special legislation that was passed to give St. Lucian incentives to add to their homes for rent. Um, presently, based on our calculation at the Tourism Authority, um, we have about 5,000 rooms. Well, no, let, let me be correct. We can accommodate about 5,000 persons at home accommodation in St. Lucia right now. We'll go towards paying some of those bills. Um, I, I don't think it takes away from our patriotism, our commitment to, to, to country, and our sense of independence. Um, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I can tell the opposition a lot of things they can focus on instead, but I don't think that's my business um, to do so. Um, yeah. And the last one. Um, the Bahamas has recorded 18 homicides for the year, and the U.S. has put a travel uh, advisory on the country, uh, citing gang violence and so on. What are your fears that that might be the case for St. Well, I, I can tell you, every time I read a story about, you know, a homicide in St. Lucia, it really pains me. And it's not even so much about tourism. It's just about, you know, our society and what it is becoming. When I read it about other Caribbean societies having similar challenges like ours, it really sets me thinking as to, you know, what's going on in our region and, and even the world um, that individuals are becoming so desensitized to the lives of other people. They're becoming so indifferent and, and this thing is really getting out of hand. Um, I, I know that there are a lot of discussions taking place with the police, like the Prime Minister always says, and he's absolutely right in that regard. Our role as government is to sit to the police and say to them, what are your strategies? What do you need from government? And then to provide it for them. We are not trained law enforcement. We're not experts in criminology and whatnot. So we don't design and develop strategies for them. Um, but they have to come up with it and they have to ask for the resources. And we have to find a way to provide as much as we can. Um, everybody can share their view as to how they believe um, this problem should end, should be dealt with. I have my own view, so like I said, it's not a learned view, because I'm not a trained law enforcement officer. I have my own views, um, and I can tell you that because of my own background and my own groundings, uh, I'm less enforcement and more social intervention. I mean, I, I, I'll make it very clear. I grew up in the youth movement. I grew up in community organizations. I grew up in an area where, you know, um, face its challenges and young men growing up and people leaving face challenges. So I'm always um, predisposed to support it first and foremost, greater social interventions um, to create opportunities for people, for educating our people, for providing psychological and other support for our people to try and change um, patterns of, of, of life. Um, and of course, law enforcement comes in when all else fails. Um, but in different approaches, and there is no single approach that can solve the problem. All the approaches must come to bear, um, from the church to the law enforcement to the social um, agencies. All of us must work um, to make sure we address this problem. But you know, every single day, like you said, it's at the back of my mind that this does not get out of hand, and we have to face the threat of a travel advisory. No, no, I mean, this is a serious, serious point you're making. Um, and, you know, only this morning I received a presentation from my team at the ministry in terms of some experiences in other countries. Um, and we, we also had the community tourism agency in attendance because we need to look at castries and to see what we can do from a, from a tourism ministry perspective to help you know, present a better castries, a more functional castries. 
Uh, and I think you're absolutely right. We, we, we need to focus on castries and what we can do differently. There have been many attempts in the past, you know, about modernization of castries and what to do and many suggestions. Um, we have to find a way to make it work because, like you said, the cruise experience along the waterfront would be enhanced. But if you venture a little deeper into the city, the experience would not be so refined. Uh, and we need to find a way. So um, that's all I can tell you. We need to. What about the uh, plan? I think that this morning Chief Deputy Brock Compton is actually the plan for the development of the city. I know the previous administration has sort of tweaked it a bit, but they kind of wanted to do something there. Um, this administration, what, what are your seeing for the city? Well, the more than one plan, there's from the time of Compton, there's um, a plan that was done under Kenny Anthony, that was done by NLBA, um, Claude Guillaume Neville Skeet. Um, they've been, in fact, that same plan inspired Walcott House on um, Chaussee Road um, and some of the other developments. What we don't have is a, an action plan as to what we're going to do. I know, for example, for community tourism, I can tell you what will happen for the next year in terms of infrastructural improvements. And, and very soon in, in Parliament, I will make an announcement on some of those things. We know what we want to do for community tourism development, but we've not focused on castries. Castries have so many dimensions. It's the commercial capital, it's the administrative capital. You know, uh, It's not a tourism center because most people tell you they go to Soufre. And Sufra is probably um, the, the, the place most visitors want to go, not Castries, ironically. But it's the closest to the ship. Some people will just walk there, uh, and it's easy and it's convenient. And we have to put it on our agenda. You're asking me some very difficult questions. <laughs> uh, I, I think I've said as much as I can uh, on this matter, um, but you, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do to improve the experience. Okay. Uh, Speaking of the experience, final taxi services. So the taxi services in Cashries, especially by the past year, we're continuously complaining about pregnant taxi drivers and what not coming. Yeah. Well, they 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 reach out to me. I mean, I I visited Point Seraphine um, last month, you know, and actually saw for myself, and I initiated some action to to kind of control it. The GPH development will address their concerns. It will. Because as we said, the old customs building will be broken down. The parking and the controls will be put in place to ensure that what existed in the past does not um, the, do not continue to exist. So I expect us to, to address that problem. I know they're very anxious and they, and, you know, there's a lot of anxiety and whatnot, but we will address it. Um, it will take us a little while to do so because to address it, you need to have the space and the infrastructure um, to be able to do it. Because, and we, 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 all I can tell you is that we have a plan to address in it um, what not. Yes. The hospitality ambassadors are um, in effect, and what it probably shows us is that we need a lot more um, because you know when there are large numbers of visitors, 
you know, you, you really need to have more people for them to really be visible. But it is in, they, they are working, they, some in Sufre, the city, and some up north. Um, some at Point Seraphine and whatnot, but we need a, a lot more than that um, for them to really be present. Uh, I'm hoping that the program will expand next year and then expand again, and as we uh, will approach a more optimum. Um, Derek Walcott Square has to be part of the solution that um, was asked earlier in terms of the city. Um, we have to make it a, a feature. And there's some little de a few developments that will take place, for example, in the next budget, we will be announcing a religious tourism project that the cathedral will be undertaking, um, a shrine that will be built to commemorate the incident that took place at the, the cathedral a few years ago, and a commemorative shrine which will be incorporated you know, with support from government as part of our Castries experience. So between the square and the cathedral, and you know, and there'll be quite a lot taking place there because very soon government will be starting work on the halls of justice, which will include um, the old Ministry of Education building and the old courthouses. So there will be some developments taking place there. Um, but we need to have the holistic um, plan for Castries to really raise up the profile of Castries. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if you remember, the, the last government stopped the project and the monies that were available for the project was diverted to some other project, um, some other project. So we need now to, to decide how it's going to be reintegrated. Um, some private individuals um, decided to, to go ahead with a plan which we equally had, which is to involve that entire street into our concept of community tourism. Um, we, we felt that you can create an experience, you know, there where people can, can actually go on and, you know, from Derek Walcott House all the way to the end to create experiences along the way um, for them. And in fact, we're thinking now of expanding it even beyond that because we're now going to include the, cash, the Masha market as an artisan market for leather work and whatnot. So we're going to, um, refurbish the Masha market and to actually create um, an artisan um, market there that will attract visitors who want particular types of of um, souvenirs, primarily leather works and other crafts, whatnot. So we probably can start an experience from more in the Masha area coming all the way to Chaussee Road. And we think there's tremendous potential for that. Um, a very kind of indigenous, very kind of of artistic expression. I mean, I'm a big supporter of street art, and you know, and you know, those kinds of expressions. So I, I think there, there are possibilities there. Um, I guess it's just for us to do it bit by bit. But it's not a forgotten um, piece of asset. So it's financing um, the issue. Well, that that's part of it, raising the financing for it, um, and also so they have numerous stakeholders that you need to constantly engage. Um, yeah. hmm? uh, a few, they have different stakeholders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, all right.